We are jumping into chapter 3 in Colossians. It means we're halfway through the book. There's four chapters in Colossians. And uh, real excited to see you. Welcome to Horizon. Big weekend. Thanks for making uh, this part of your big Super Bowl weekend plans. I guess the tacos sort of got uh, rained out, but we'll be having those back in a, in, a, in a weekend or two. Guys, looking forward. If you haven't signed up, there's still room. There's still time. Going to be a great uh, weekend of fellowship out at Murrieta next weekend. Uh, as we've been looking at Colossians, if you've, if you've joined us, if you're new, this is a, an amazing study in the sense that there probably isn't any other book where Paul comes out stronger as to who Jesus Christ really is. And that was all of chapter 1, spilling into chapter 2. It's a, it's a church in a town that Paul's never visited, uh, but as Christianity is expanding here, just to sort of give you the picture, as it's expanding from its home base, and its home base would have been there in Jerusalem, if we could throw a map up, you want to see this map, kind of the region there, you see Jerusalem tucked down in the, in, in the farthest left um, uh, right corner, and then ultimately in the top left corner you have Rome, and it's heading that way, it's spreading that way, and it's fighting against the culture, it's fighting against uh, the systems of the day, and, and the systems are beginning, the culture is beginning to um, trickle into the church. And they're, they're kind of at a point of, uh, of, of there being a question as to which direction is it going to take? You know, is it going to continue to stand and, 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 and believe that there is a better way, or is it going to cave? Is it going to go soft? And, and obviously the point I mentioned this to you because not much has changed. And we find ourselves here today, you know, surrounded by a, a, a culture that, that loves to shape us, a culture that loves to form our thinking, a culture that wants to, you know, we're really at an intersection here today, as was the church in Colossae, between, uh, between the culture and between our faith. And what's interesting is Colossae there on the map, you can kind of see it pointed out, uh, is being affected now by Ephesus, uh, which is about 100 miles away. And uh, if you remember in our study, it's got a sister city, Colossae does. There's Ephesus about 100 miles away that's really impacting and shaping the thinking of the church in Colossae, Ephesus is, which is good and bad. I mean, there probably isn't another church in all of Scripture that starts off stronger and healthier than the church at Ephesus, but it begins to lose its way, and that's Paul's concern. In fact, not only Paul's, it's Jesus that writes a letter to the church in Ephesus and says, I see what you're doing. You got all this going on, this and that. You're even taking notes. <laughs> but you have, anybody remember what he says in Revelation? You have left your first, you've left your first love, man. And somehow, uh, culture has begun to shape and twist and change the heart of the church at Ephesus. And not only Ephesus that is affecting Colossae, but there's this twin city kind of thing going on. Sort of a Minneapolis, St. Paul, Dallas, Fort Worth kind of thing going on between Colossae and its sister city. Anyone remember? You remember? Because Jesus writes a letter to that church too, Laodicea. Laodicea, I'd rather you be hot or cold, you're lukewarm. You don't come out on a rainy weekend. <laughs> Glad you're here. All of this is affecting Colossae, the way they think. This, this, this Greco, listen, this Greco-Roman culture of superiority is changing the way the church is thinking and ultimately changing the way the church is thinking about whether or not Jesus is enough. Is he enough? Do you need more than Christ to be fulfilled and, 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 and accomplished and, and, and complete? Or can you call it done in Christ? And, 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 and you have that effect today. I mean, you have, you have, you have all the temples and statutes and, 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 and things. Do we have one, guys? Yeah, of, of how this thinking shaped and tweaked and changed the church back then and and. And, and certainly we would agree the case is the same today. I, I think. Um, certainly going into a week like this where it's, it's, you know, not just the big celebratory. You'll have, you know, you'll have 100 million people tuning in for this game. 
and like six billion uh, bets on the game, right? So um, as big as that is, it just kind of spills one thing into another. And, and, and how culture shapes us is pretty fascinating. Last weekend, we looked at how legalism, if, if we let it, we got to be careful that, that, that legalism doesn't end up winning the day and, 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 and stripping us as it did in Ephesus of our love, of our love for the Lord, to love him with all of our heart. You know, going into the State of the Union, how fascinating would it be if the president got up and said the State of the Union is that the state of our union is in a state of crisis and just called everybody to prayer. Just called an, 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 a national call to prayer. And whether he does or not, we could. In fact, don't be like looking at me like, that's crazy. It happened before. It happened actually in the city of Nineveh. When Jonah walked in, shortest sermon in all of Scripture. 40 days, you're dead. Unless you repent, let's close in prayer. That was it. <laughs> and he was kind of grumpy when he gave it. Hadn't had his coffee. And, and it says, from the king, doesn't it? You remember? From the king on down. They put on sackcloth and ashes and repented, and the Lord spared the city. If my people, my people who are called by my name, declares the Lord, would humble themselves and pray and seek my face, turn from their wicked ways. I'd heal their land. And something's happening in Colossae for Paul to be concerned enough to write that somehow throughout history, culture is known for bad answers to really needed questions. And so he wants to combat against this thing combat against the, the 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 false news the way of thinking that 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 so often not only surrounds us but shapes us that Jesus Christ is the answer and the world wants to scream back and say that's relative truth is relative it doesn't even matter anymore it matters it matters. And your value this morning, your value as humans is going to be placed in something. It's going to be placed somewhere. Is it placed in your, in your, in your pocketbook, in your wallet, in your portfolio? Is that your value? Or in your likes or your followers or your friends or how, how, how big of a Super Bowl party you can throw, or is it truly only found in Him? Look at chapter 3. If then, if, here he is, Paul, hoping for the best, continues on what he's been saying. In fact, back up with me in chapter 2, look at verse 20. Therefore, if you died with Christ, okay, that's Good Friday. Look at chapter 3. Chapter 3, verse 1. If then you were raised with him, okay, so he's, he's taken him through the process of Good Friday. Now is the, is, is, the, is the power of the resurrection. And if you were raised with Christ, then seek those things which are above. Don't go for the culture and, and, and society and get shaped in where your thinking is concerned on this. On, on, on this. It's a war path. I don't know about you, but this evil, demonic, barbaric, pro-abortion thing that's coming out of New York State and now followed by Virginia, although it was turned down, you watch how quickly they will spin that thing and try and get it passed again. And you know why all these states are doing this? And it's not just New York and, and, and Virginia, although they're highly populated, so they get a lot of press. It's little old Rhode Island that also is making their case known and and louisiana watch louisiana watch louisiana and rhode island watch the state of the union this week prayer breakfast on thursday a lot happening in our capital needs our prayers but you put it into context this atrocity that's happened it's no longer a pro-life a pro-life and a pro-choice it is pro-life and pro-death 
is what it's become. And uh, there isn't anything r really new about it or creative about it. I don't, I don't sense at all that, that, that Satan is all that creative. It just, it just keeps, for the most part, baiting the same hook he does. And so you have a, uh, check this out, you have a, you have a, a baby that's born uh, who's going to be a leader that ultimately God uses to set his people free from slavery back in the days of Egypt. And the baby's name was Moses. And, 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 and the government, in fear of that, uh, at the prompting, I believe, of the seed and thought that Satan planted in their mind, the devil prompted the government to kill all the babies. Right? Remember? Remember? And so baby Moses comes along, this, this new leader chosen by God that's going to ultimately be led by the Lord to set God's people free has to be hidden in a, in a, in a, in a, in a little boat, in a basket amongst the uh, reeds in the Nile until the danger is past. You fast forward that with me until the birth of Jesus. The new Moses, the leader of God's people to deliver them and set them free from sin and slavery in the, in the, in the system and the culture of, of Egypt. And the same devil prompted the government to kill all the babies. You with me? And so he has to be hidden. And the angel comes and speaks to uh, Mary and Joseph and, and, and says, don't, don't hide him in the Nile River, but in the nation to where the Nile is found, Egypt. He flees and is hid until the danger pass. And so what's happening today? I don't know how you connect the dots, but it seems to me we have the same devil with the same strategy and a new government. And in the midst of it, Paul writes and says, Seek the things which are above. That means the values of the heart of God, the values of His system. In light and in place of the systems that surround you on this planet. Seek the things that are above where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. And set your minds, look at this, verse 2. If we just did this, church, set your minds on things above, not on things on the earth. For you died. You died. There's that Good Friday reference back there in chapter 2, verse 20. If you then died with Christ, the basic principles of the world, right? Here he is, here he is again saying, you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, when Christ, who is our life, our life, our everything, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. There's some prophecy. There's some good news of, of, of what's to come. We're going to be raptured off this planet really for the sole purpose not only of celebrating the marriage supper of the Lamb in heaven, but to return with the Lord in glory. Look what it says. You will appear with Him in glory. Therefore, put to death your members. This is an ongoing process. It's not like one and done. Sounds like it there in verse 3. You died, okay, when you, when you came to Christ, it was, it, was, it was the putting to death. But it is a constantly fought battle of, of, of continuing to put these things down and to stop feeding our flesh. Therefore, he says it again in verse 5, put to death, and he gets real specific here. Look at this. Put to death your members which are on the earth. It's talking about us and, 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 and within us. Look what he says, specifically mentions these. Fornication. Just put that to death. Put it to death. Reckon it dead. Just drive a spike through it. Fornication. Uncleanness. Passion. Okay, let's just sum up those first three that he mentioned into the same category called porn. Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry. And because of these things, the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience. 
right? It's coming. The wrath of God is coming. It ain't gonna be. It ain't gonna be rain again. It was one okay? It is gonna rain, but not water. Not water, right? It's gonna rain. It's gonna rain fire. Hello, hello. So put those things to death because those are the things to which are going to bring the wrath of God upon the sons of disobedience in which you yourselves once were. That's, that's who you used to be. You used to walk in those things. You used to live in those things. I, I love, uh, usually when I read in the morning when my eyes are still blurry and groggy and anyone else with me in that? Yeah. So I read the message because it's just, so it's just, it's easy going down. And so, um, I'll read that in my devotions. And Eugene Peterson, I love how he put this. Just listen to this. Just soak this in this morning. Because in Colossians, he, sa- he says this. Here's what he says. He says, At one time you all had your backs turned to God. That's what Paul's saying here in chapter 3. At one time you all had your backs turned to God, thinking rebellious thoughts of him and giving him trouble every chance you had. But now, here's the resurrection, here's the change. But now, by giving himself completely at the cross, actually dying for you, Christ brought you over to God's side. Isn't that good? Christ, you didn't do it, I didn't do it, we didn't. Christ brought you over to God's side. That's why today I want to talk to you about the game and the goat. The greatest of all time. The game, the goat, and the guaranteed win. Here it is. Christ brought you over to God's side. And put your lives together. Whole and holy in his presence. And and then Peterson says this. Peterson says, and you don't walk away from a gift like that. Amen? 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 I love that. That is awesome. That's what Paul's saying here. He's saying, put to death. Those things that are killing you anyway. Okay? Fornication, uncleanness, passion, evil desire, covetousness, which is idolatry, because these are the things which the wrath of God is coming upon the sons of disobedience, in in which you yourselves once walked when you lived in them. But now, look at this, look at verse 8. But now you yourselves are to put off. Okay, so that's like you, it's game day, you in the locker room, time to change. Put off the old uniform. Put off the old jersey. Put off the old identity. Put off all of these. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. On the fifth tee and the sixth fairway and the seventh green and, 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 and do not lie to one another. It's like, well, I don't do any of that. Liar. You, you're lying. Don't, don't lie to one another. He's like probably getting a little bit of pushback. He's like, got to put off all these things. Take these old layers off. Anger, wrath, malice, blasphemy, filthy language out of your mouth. Well, that ain't me. And don't lie. Don't lie to one another since you have put off the old man with his deeds and you have now put on, okay, here's the big change. You've put on the new man who is renewed in knowledge according to the image of him who created him. Where there's neither Greek or Jew, that's that's your old jersey. Where there's neither Greek or Jew, circumcised or uncircumcised, barbarian or Scythian, slave or free, but Christ, come on church, Christ is all and in all. He's all, okay? That's deism. He's he's out there. I know he's out there somewhere. You're a theist. And he's in all. Now he's Lord and Savior. All, that's chapter 1 of Colossians. And all continues that he made to exist. It consistently exists because he says it exists. All and in all. In all. In all my thinking and doing and, 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 and behaving and, 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 and acting. All and 
Christ is all and in all. That's it, man. That's, that, that is, listen, the game, the game, the game is life that Paul's talking about here. The game is life. And, and the stakes, hey, the stakes are high. I, I know like uh, six billion bucks are going to be bet on this game and most of it illegally. That's nothing compared to the stakes in this game of life. There's souls in the balance where eternity is concerned and your opposition, your foe, the devil, still baiting the same hook, trying to trip you up and render you in defeat. But the greatest of all time is Jesus. Amen. Hallelujah. And he has come in. I love how Peterson puts it. He has brought you over to God's side. And put your lives together whole and holy in his presence. And you don't walk away from a gift like that. That is the greatest of all time, doing what he does. And here's what he does. He secures for you the win. He guarantees it. You're like, how secure? Really? Seriously? It looks like the enemy's winning out there. You know, it might look like the enemy is winning right up until the two-minute warning. But our Jesus wins. Come on, someone say amen. Amen. Hey, our Jesus, win. you might think that the enemy is winning right up to the last play of the game, but our Jesus is coming through. Well, how solid, how secure, what are the odds? You know what a lot of people have done? They've turned this into the fantasy league. This ain't the fantasy league. This is truth. This is the reality. And there's a huge payoff in the end what is the payoff in the end it's not even up for debate what he has done for us is so clear so historical what he did is what we're about to celebrate this morning your true victory and the guaranteed win is what waits for you in these elements that represent what christ did on our behalf when he brought us out of darkness and into his marvelous light he set us free you guys that's the victory you were, you were paid for. You were bought outright. And at top dollar you were. Um, you got to know this. You got to believe this. You gotta li- you, 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 you gotta live in the confidence of this, knowing that you were purchased for the most. Some of you don't believe this. You were purchased for the most premium price in all the universe. You weren't on sale. It wasn't sort of like. You know, going, going through the, the yellow pages of, of, uh, of Craigslist. And he, and he found for himself an awesome deal here on earth. And got you at a discount. He didn't get you at a discount. You... you you, you were bought with the most premium price ever imaginable. The, the, the very precious life of God's only begotten Son. You were not a good deal. He blew the wad on you to now bring you out of Egypt, out of slavery, out of sin, and set you free. And whom the Son sets free free, I feel like preaching, is free indeed, you guys. Hallelujah. He stepped up for the likes of you and me, and you're like, I know I'm awesome. You're not. I'm not. But he cashed in for us. He put it all out there for you. And that's what Paul is saying to this church. He's saying, you are so valuable to God. Don't get tweaked in to this conformity of everything surrounding Colossae there with, 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 
with the lukewarmness of Laodicea that's seeping in and the lovelessness of Ephesus that's seeping in and, and, and wherever Rome is going in all of that, just, just put it into that context and now blow it up because it's done nothing but, but, but gotten worse for our day. And he's like, I have loved you with an everlasting love. I've I've come to set you free. And you're like, yeah, but I'm not really seeing. Oh, turn to Isaiah. Turn to Isaiah. Turn to Isaiah chapter 52 with me, would you? Isaiah um, 52. And, and, And we will camp out in the guaranteed win of what, of what Isaiah is told by the Lord concerning this great gift of our salvation. And and I know for some of you, you're like, well, I don't think it's really 52. It should be 53. It's Isaiah 53, Bob. 53 is the one that speaks so clearly of this salvation. I mean, who's believed our report, right? 53. To whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? And he he grew up before him, a tender root, and and, and, and wow, he's, he's... but 53, here's that book i got to get around to writing. 53 is all based on the promises laid out in 52. So look at Isaiah 52 with me. Look at verse 1. Awake! That's a great one. Awake! Because they're like beginning like to be bored with it all. He's like, uh, oh, no tacos, really? Did he actually... Away, he's like spiritually, he's just like kind of like wanting to shake and rattle the church. It's falling asleep. Awake, awake, put on your strength, O Zion. So, this sounds to me like Colossians 3, it's like suiting up for the big game. Put on your strength. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city, for the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. Shake yourself. (laughs) Shake yourself. It's like whatever has been holding you back and convincing you otherwise, in the words of the amazing theologian Taylor Swift, shake it off. (laughs) Shake it off. He's like, shake yourself from the dust. And arise. It's game day. Sit down, O Jerusalem. Isn't that a crazy thought? He's like, get dressed. Get ready. Wake up. Shake it off and sit down. Because he's going to fight this battle for you, church. That's what, he, he, that's what he says to Moses, this leader of God's people now, delivering them from the hand of Pharaoh and slavery and straw that's been removed from the making of the bricks. And they run, right? They run. They are out of Dodge as fast as you can get out of Dodge, only to realize they've run as far as they can run. And now they're at a dead end. They're at a cul-de-sac. They're at the Red Sea. And, 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 and Moses is like, ah! And the people are like, ah! Because you can see all the Egyptians and the dust bowl of the enemy team gaining ground on them and God says the same thing to Moses that he's saying through Isaiah to you sit down in fact he says in chapter 13 just stand still and you will see the salvation of the Lord hallelujah that's what he's saying here he's like like, wake up shake it off and sit down and, 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 and loose yourself. Look what he says in verse 2. Loose your, like loosen up. Loosen up. Come on. It's game day. Come on. Loosen up. Shake it off. Loose, loosen up. Loose yourself from the bonds of your neck. Can't live like a slave any longer to envy and, 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 and malice and anger and wrath and all the things that Paul is reminding you that you've been set free of. So shake those things off and loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of of Zion. For thus says the Lord, um, verse 3, look at this. Look at verse 3, chapter 52. You have sold yourselves for nothing. And you shall be redeemed. 
without money. For thus says the Lord, My people went down at first into Egypt to dwell there, and the Assyrian oppressed them without cause. And, and uh, So this is a, a, a bit of a look back on Isaiah's part to, to, uh, to a pretty brutal first half. It's a losing first half. And he's reminding them that you, you, first, you know, you were, you, you were in Egypt there and, and the Assyrians, they were pounding you. They were oppressing you. And, 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 and therefore, what have I here, says the Lord, that my people are taken away for nothing? Those who rule over them make them wail, says the Lord. I mean, they were crying out. And, and, and my name was blasphemed continually every day. Therefore, my people shall know my name. Therefore, they shall know in that day that I am he who speaks. Behold, it is I. So here you, here you kind of have this halftime of, of, of leaving a pretty brutal beat up. And I'm, I'm, I'm honest. The, the parts of the Old Testament, man, it's, it's tough to read. Slow going, man. It's thick. And then you have this break, and something happens. Look at verse 7. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. And that ain't me, Mr. Preacher. That's, that's your Messiah that shows up. That's your Savior. How beautiful upon the mountains are the feet of him who brings good news. This is a great big turnaround. Who proclaims peace. Who, who brings glad tidings of good things. I don't know, that sounds like Christmas to me. That's, that's glad tidings of, 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 of good things, who proclaims salvation, who says to Zion, your God, what, come on, your God reigns. Your watchmen shall lift up their voices, and their voices they'll sing together, for, 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 for they shall see eye to eye when the Lord brings back Zion. Break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem. It's like a huge turnaround from just dull and, 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 and dark and, and hard into the, into the light. Man, it's Gandalf. It's Gandalf showing up and, and this army of light, right? I could show you that, but it's brutal, right? No, I can't. I can't because like orcs' heads are flying. And that's, that's what's happening here. This Savior has arrived. He has come and he's proclaiming salvation, he is. And he's saying, break forth. Wake up. Break forth into joy. Sing together, you waste places of Jerusalem, for the Lord has comforted his people. He has redeemed Jerusalem. Check this out. Look at verse 10. The Lord has made bare his holy arm. Now you're going to see some big arms in the game today, right? It's game day. Guns are out. But it isn't these ripped biceps of the offensive line of the rams or the or the defensive line of the page it is the lord you talk about a ripped bicep <laughs> it's the lord who made bare his holy arm and in the eyes of all the nations and all the ends of the earth shall see the salvation of our god the arm of salvation of our God. So depart, and this is the words of Paul in, in, in Colossians 3, and he's very detailed and specific in his list about the things that you and I need to depart, that we need to let go of, that we need to strip and shake off and, 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 and loosen, as the writer of Hebrews says, the every weight and snare that so easily holds us back from running this race of faith he's like look at verse 11 depart from that depart from that go out from there and touch no unclean thing and go out from the midst of her and be clean for who bear the vessels of the lord you 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 are the temple of the holy spirit you 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 are the vessel of the Lord. You who bear the vessels of the Lord. 
Have you ever seen that before? That is awesome. For you shall not go out with haste, nor go by flight. For the Lord, check this out, the Lord will go before you. What's that? Guys, what's that? That's your offense. And he, as the greatest of all time, just ought to be declared today your leader, your quarterback, calling the plays. For the Lord will go before you. That's, that's offense. Look, look what else it says. And the Lord God of Israel will be your rear guard. What's that? D. Defense. He's your offense. He's your, he's your, he's your defense. Wow, I love this. Behold, my servant shall deal prudently, and he shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Just as many were astonished at you, so his visage, and here's a peek of what chapter 53 begins to describe in detail. His visage was marred more than any man. Here's what it cost him to win the game for you and me. The guaranteed win, his visage. He was unrecognizable, he was. Hamburger meat, beaten to a pulp. You're going to take this piece of bread, this piece of bread represents his body, and it's, 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 it's nicely shaped and not too big, not too small. And what you really should do is crush it into powder, this gluten-free piece of... Because that's, that's, that's what he did for you marred his visage his image he became unrecognizable why so so you would now be recognized by god as his child set free through the price paid for you by your savior on the cross a visage so marred more than any other man that is formed more than the sons of men. Why? So shall he sprinkle many nations and kings. Look at this. Verse 15. Kings, I love this, shall shut their mouths at him. Every culture, every system, every kingdom, every rival, it's like zip it, man. Every king is going to shut their mouth at him for what had not been told them they shall see and what they had not heard they shall consider right wow that's a game changer because some of you are like whoa 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 well wait a minute what about those people that had never heard about you they're gonna hear they're gonna hear and they're gonna see and every knee is going to bow. And every tongue is going to confess. And every king's mouth is going to be shut that they may see and consider what our God has done. Hallelujah. You're either in or you're not in. Because this, my friends, is what wins the game for you. You either, listen, you either win because of this or you lose. It comes down to just accepting and, and receiving what he has done on your behalf. It's just saying yes to this. It's not having to go to class or, 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 or read some theological treaties on this. It's, it's not getting a degree. It's just saying yes. It's saying yes to what he's done. It's saying Amen. To all that he has stepped into this world to accomplish for you for he is the greatest of all time and he has won this game of life for you and he has guaranteed you the victory even in the moments to which you you might not see it or believe it i um as many of you i'm sure are praying hard and long for ann graham lots right now billy's daughter who's suffering from a horrible bout of cancer and she wrote this she said I worship you in the good and in the bad 
I worship you as my good, good father. For when you allow, listen, when you allow bad things to happen to me, your child, whom you love, as I seek to live according to your purpose, I know that it's ultimately for my good and for your glory the things that I face in this life. Your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are higher than mine. And the scope of your love is measureless. And I trust you. Are you with her this morning? Because this is your game-winning move to put your trust in Him. She's like, I trust you. I lay my life down before you. And then she says this, in the midst of her cancer, she says this, thank you for never being neglectful or whimsical, but always being attentive and intentional. Thank you for showing me that I can be confident that in all things, with absolutely no exceptions, everything will work together for my ultimate good and for your ultimate glory. And when I'm tempted to complain, and some of us are, and that's why Paul's writing to the church and saying, this is what's become of you. He's like, throw the complaining out in the trash. Because you don't even have cancer in your complaint. She's like, um, when I'm tempted to complain, remind me that before you went to the cross, you took the cup that represented death. And you gave thanks. Help me to give thanks. Help me to see your glory in the darkness of pain. Your blessings in the disappointments of life. May they shine through for your glory in Jesus' name. And I'm, I'm just like blown away by that. That he is greater than whatever the devil is trying to use to get you down. Here's, here, here's when you lose. You lose when you don't show up for the game. Here's when you lose. You lose when you're not owned by the owner. You lose when you're trying to do it in your own strength. Instead of in the holy, look at that. Wow. <laughs> instead, of, instead of trusting in the holy arm of God, of God instead of in this garbage. Listen, you are never going to outpower the enemy. You never are going to outpower the enemy. You're getting all buff. So you can blitz him. So you can sack him. <laughs> These are all football analogies I work very hard on. Uh, <laughs> to somehow manhandle your enemy, to, to somehow maneuver, to somehow manage. You are never going to outpower him. You can only out-truth him. Out-truth him. Based on the truth of this, for this is not the fantasy league. This is reality, and greater is he that is in you. Greater is, not greater is you, greater is he that is in you, you get to, because of his presence in you, you get to intercept the lies of the enemy. And you get to stand on the truth while the world is slipping away on a very steep slope. God as the owner, Christ as your defense and your offense, his presence is, is, is your power, his word is your light and wisdom and offense as you go forward. Let Jesus run every play. Amen? And you will win every time, church. You will, to the glory of God. I, um, I, I grew up in the bumper sticker generation. Millennials don't seem to be in them as much as we were, but um, we were into those bumper stickers, and one stands out that used to say this. Do you remember this one? Christians aren't perfect. Why? What, what did it say? They're just forgiven.
Okay, look at me, look at me, look, look. Nonsense, that bumper sticker. Throw that out, too. You're like, well, wait a minute. I'm like, I'm like, just like holding tight and, 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 and hard and hold fast to my forgiveness. Okay, good. But it's not an end in itself. That's not your victory. That's not the best you have going for you. Christians, are per- Christians aren't perfect. They're just forgiven. That says more about your driving <laughs> than it says about your ultimate spiritual outcome. Is it just forgiveness that you're after in all of this? Seriously, is it just forgiveness? Yes, Alex, I'll take forget 500 for forgiveness. <laughs> My mom used to sing. I remember she would be doing chores in the house or in the yard. And, and, and here's her song. Mom would sing. Mom, are you here? Mom, you're here? Come sing. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> and he walks with me and I'm like I'm, I'm the kid I'm like this I'm like where is he right and she's singing and he walks with me and he talks with me and I'm, I'm the kid I'm like speak up and he tells me I am his own. I am his own. You are not just forgiven, church. You are his. And he is yours. Because you can forgive something and still not like the thing you have forgiven. And, And that seems to make more sense to me that he would forgive me, but still not like me, because I don't even like myself that much. No, no, no. You are his own, and the joy we share as we travel there, none other could ever know. You are known. You are owned. You are loved. You are accepted. You are his, and he is yours because of this, the guaranteed victory of your win for the greatest, and I mean greatest, greatest of all time, stepped out of his world and into ours to win the game that sets us free. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Father, as uh, the men come to serve us this Super Bowl meal, we praise you. We rejoice and thank you that we are your own, bought and paid for by the precious blood of our Lord and Savior. May that be celebrated today and for eternity more than we celebrate anything else more than we live for anything else may we live in the light of the victory that you have come to provide for we praise you and give you our great thanks as we receive it in all of its fullness. And I pray that as we do receive it in all of its fullness, chains would be broken of doubt and depression and sickness and disease. Chains would be broken of sin and the suffering that sin causes. May guilt in hearts that have piled up for years vanish and dissolve. 
in the power and mighty name of Jesus. We, we partake together for our good and for your glory in Jesus' name. And the church said...